This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Christiane Lyons. In her ongoing series, Some Women, she explores, by distorting the female body, the cycle of women's objectification throughout art history and culture while at the same time attempting to break the cycle by imbuing the figures with subjectivity. One of her paintings from the series is included in the Women Painting Women exhibition currently on display at the Modern in Fort Worth. And now, constructing the image of the modern woman with Christian Lyons. week on the Art Sense podcast. Christian, I usually like to start with artists with a hypothetical, which is if you're at a dinner party and you're seated next to someone who's never met you before, they don't know your work, they don't know who you are, how would you describe what you do and what your work looks like to them? Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me. Um, and that's a great first question. <laughs> and that's one I get a lot. Um, First of all, I would probably say um, that I'm an artist and then either that or sometimes say I'm a painter, but then I have to clarify that I'm not a house painter, I'm a fine artist (laughs) painter. Um, And uh, then um, I usually get asked the subject of uh, what medium do I work with and I, I work with oil paints and what subject matter. Um, and uh, I am a figurative artist um, or a figurative painter. Um, and I primarily paint women. Um, and then I go into the subject of that. If they want to learn some more, um, I usually say that um, I take multiple images of women to create uh, a new figure um, and a new female figure. Um, and then I see where it goes from there. Yeah, yeah. I think you even said, you know, what do you paint? You, you said some women. Mm-hmm. It, isn't that the name of your most recent series? Um, it's the name of an ongoing series um, that I started back. Well, I actually came up with the idea around 2016. Um, and it took me a while to be able to really hash it together and make it work. Um um, but it's kind of a play on the term or the, the saying some women, um, it's a ton in, tongue in cheek because yes, it is some women, um, but sometimes in our culture, it's used, um, can be used not in, in um, not in a, in a great way. It, it can infer certain things. And I liked the play on that, um. So uh, to play with words. Like you were saying, they're kind of typified by, they're figurative, the figures that, you know, obviously a female form, but they're an amalgamation, right? That we, 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 and we can see where the parts have been put together, sort of, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Where do you source that material? I mean, do you have models, friends? Is it taken from popular media? Um, Well, it's important for for me, um, I started out knowing I wanted to, I, I used to paint the fig, I used to paint the female figure primarily in graduate school and before that. And then I kind of, after graduate school, I started um, incorporating more art history into my work. Um, uh, I'm, I've always been dealing with appropriation, um, actually even in high school before I knew the term was appropriation. <laughs> um, and in a conceptual matter, um, and that kind of uh, built more um, in grad school and on. Um, and I knew I wanted to go back. I was like, kind of in a slump, actually. And I knew I wanted to go back to painting the female figure. And I was like, what way can I do it in a new way that's going to challenge me? Um, and I was looking at um, women um, and other, not just women artists, but artists in general that have... Um, kind of challenge that um like uh Wengeki Mutu um her collage work um her earlier collage work um that incorporates painting um 
I was really interested in that. Um, and I was interested in trying to find a way of doing that and speaking about such things, um, but doing it all with paint. Um, so yes, they do appear um, kind of collaged together. Um, and I get the images from doing uh, random uh, searches on the internet. Um, and it's important to me, and I put in like key terms that have been used throughout art history and our visual culture to describe women, um, like model, um, or a pose, laying down, or sometimes I put in even the word Olympia, um, mm. and I see what pops up on a color, um, and it's always so interesting to me to see what comes up, and um, I I really like working that way because to me it's what um, everyone um, it's what people are currently looking at and being influenced by, and it's important to me to work with images um, that that is being. Um, that people are, are, are looking at right now um, and dealing with those images in some way. I mean, and that's really interesting. It, it, I mean, it's almost like, it's almost like you're writing your own algorithm on what is the world searching for in terms of, it's almost like, a, I wouldn't say an every man. I mean, it's every woman. It's a reflection of what imagery is being put out there for mm -hmm. the female form at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, it's particularly interesting to see um, how um, it's uh, it's getting wider too, which I think is great, and it's less um, stare. It's uh, um, you can gradually see snippets of it getting uh, more inclusive, um, and uh, like. Um, a lot of non-binary people have shown up in my in, in my searches too, um, which I think is fascinating. Um, and um, not just women that are uh, size two, you know, um, <laughs> and what we uh, think of in our culture as models um, right now. Um, so yeah, it gives me a lot of information. I'm sure Google has its own algorithm. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Right. And Google knows way too much about us, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it'd be interesting, you know, if if I search for the same terms, whether I would even see the same images that you see, right? Exactly. Yeah. So how do you curate that bevy of images that that come come back? I mean, are you just kind of going with your gut? Are you thinking about how these may possibly go go with one another? Do you collect, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens and then kind of look at piecing things together or you know, yeah. how how does it <laughs> <laughs> Yes, all of the above, right? That's what I do. <laughs> um I use um I use uh Photoshop to make um maquettes that I then what I call maquettes or sketches. Um and then I print those out and then that's what I work from to paint the final painting. Um, and so I use the feature in, this is plugging Adobe Photoshop here, but I use the feature in Photoshop uh, Bridge where you can collect images. And then um, I start to look for ones, yeah, that have um, certain similarities or might be interesting or don't have similarities, but might be interesting and that's what makes them interesting. And then they might appear um, good together in some way. Um, and I usually start with a central figure and then build on that, um, that I'm interested in. And it's more, it's almost, well, for right now, for example, I'm starting a series. Uh, it's a continuation of this series with mm -hmm. some women, but now I'm bringing um, uh, animals into it um, okay. and how they're used into, in our, um, culture particularly in ads um, and are being objectified in the same way that uh, women are. Um, and I've come up with a lot of interesting <laughs> things sure. um, and it's been really fun um, to try to put those two together. Um, so something will, so I don't know, like they're for like, 
right now I'm looking at, I found a photo that interested me that has a bunch of rabbits in it. And mm-hmm. so it reminded me kind of of Alice in Wonderland. Um, and then, so of course my mind immediately goes to them because I named my paintings after uh, women that I admire, um, women artists. Um, my mind immediately goes to like, oh, I could possibly name it after Alice Neal. Um, and I could have some, then I, then my mind goes to what art history reference could I use in the background? So I've been starting to incorporate, um, art historical references in my backgrounds, um, to create almost like a surreal environment for them. Um, and what could emphasize that or play upon that Alice theme? Um, so I, I found a early per Kirkaby that has this mushroom in it and tree wow. and and um so yeah that's how kind of my brain goes and all fires in all different ways <laughs> um you know it's it's really interesting because I mean I think um one of the hardest things as a figurative artist who wants to be conceptual I think is trying to get to um like a creative subconscious right and like mm-hmm. you're and I, and I hear you going through a creative process where you're you're trying to pull in these non-linear things, but in a way that they all relate to to one another in in some small way. And in, and I feel like you're you're kind of drawing on uh, on a knowledge of the art world and art history to try to create these images that can communicate on a lot of different levels because i mean at the first level it's you know what do you see from across the room and visually is it stimulating but for the person that can recognize frank stella or matisse or or whatever or you know recognize the name you know you start kind of piecing together layers of meaning right Mm -hmm. there are a lot of layers (laughs) not only in my maquette but in the work itself, it just, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on in my work. Um, recently someone called it raucous, which I thought was very cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, the layers of meaning and the layers in which a piece of work hits you. Um, I, mean, I conceptually, I, I learned from the best. My mentor was, uh, John Balzari. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um he always talked about um the different layers of that of meaning that you know the initial first layer of you know it, it's it can be a great idea but it's still gotta look good basically is what right. he told me once um and then from there like where can it take you like how far can it go like is it a one liner or can it go can it push farther than that um, and I like the idea of being able to do that. And so not just um, attract the person that knows their art history, but also attract the person that doesn't know anything about art at all. Um, that might just like to look at a painting and get new ideas about art, hopefully. I saw in your bio that you studied at UCLA and, mm-hmm. you know, a study under like John Baldessari, Elizabeth Payton. And I think if I were looking at your your body of work and not knowing that, I don't know if it would have struck me their influence. <laughs> really? Oh, that's good to hear. I, would, I know that's interesting to hear. But once I read that, I feel like I can see them in there. Mm-hmm. For for example, like the 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 piece that is that the women painting women you know, mm-hmm. group show at uh, at the Modern in Fort Worth, uh, Yayoi. I know the dots are associated with Kusama, but it's like those are kind of like look a lot like the dots that Baldessari always put over people's faces, right? And and I know I, th- yeah. I think I saw some images that you had done a little bit further back where you were obscuring people's faces and but you know, can you can you kind of talk about how as an artist you kind of pick and choose what becomes you? you gain instruction, you admire artists. And at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. it's kind of a supermarket of, uh, of things that resonate with you. How have you experienced that in terms of at the end of the day, having something that I think really looks like yours and only yours? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, I, um, it's, I feel it's taken me, I feel like my painting is always in my 
are I'm represented by Malik Setti and Briggs in Los Angeles, and it's run by um, Anna Malik Setti and Michael Briggs. And Anna and I always have this discussion about. She's like, I can tell you, because my work previous to this work, uh, this series, um, some people are confused that's to the jump um, from, it was primarily about art history, but it included images of women. Um, and um, and before that, it was, it was also more, and then in grad school, it was more about kind of pop culture and being in Los Angeles. Um, and it had included figures. And, but she says, I can tell. And she's like, I can easily see what's that to it. And I was like, oh, I don't know if other people can. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, I can now, and I look back at it, and um, especially with certain pieces and how I was led to this point, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I'm just so grateful that I finally have caught into this point. Um, and, uh, but yes, I think when you, I went into grad school right after I went to UC Berkeley for undergrad and then um, I applied to grad school right after, accepted at UCLA and was like, okay, well, I got in, so I better go. Um, and uh, so I, I think I went in, I went into it learning a lot there and, um, but coming out, um, not, you know, the work looks different. It, I, my work has matured since then, um, and I've solidified my ideas. Um, and I think um, I still have the voices of my professors in my head and the people that influence me when I'm in my studio. Um, I still have them asking their questions, but I don't. I feel like my work has gotten to that point where um, it is not as uh, directly uh, influenced by those words um, and it's more influenced by my words or in my thinking. Um, and I think it happens quickly for some people, um, some artists and others, it takes some time like me, I think. Um, but I feel like I finally found um, a way that I want to express myself that's uniquely mine, um, that I feel really strongly about. Um, and uh, it's actually due to, um, I took a critique class with Laura Owens, my, um, I think it was my last semester in grad school. And I didn't, I remembered at the time, but I was working on other work and um, graduating and um, I remember thinking that's a great thing and um, I uh, was going through this hard time I think before I, I told you before I uh, came up with this work um, and she mentioned like what would I paint if this was uh, she asked herself what would I paint if this was my last day on earth mm. And I thought, well, that's intense, you know? <laughs> and, right. And I got to the point, I was like, okay, I'm going to re-ask myself that. What would I paint if this was my last day on earth? And yeah, I, I feel like this is what I would paint. It, it combines all those things that I love. It combines the female figure. It combines um, uh, color and um, and art history. Um, so, and experimenting with... Um, what you can do with figurative painting in terms of uh, the push and pull of abstraction um, and figuration. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not, but or if I rambled a little bit there. <laughs> I, you know, the the show is intended for you to ramble, not me, and so I apologize for the length okay. of my questions. But that no, you it's know. okay. That that was an intent. That was when that could um, uh, lead to rambling. I think. Uh, on one's part, because it, it was a long journey for me, I feel like, to get to this point. Um, but uh, I feel like I'm in a good place now. So, In your response there, the, that, um, that question of what would I paint if uh, this were my last day, if, if this was my last painting? And I think, you know, I've talked to some artists, and I, I feel like sometimes artists, you know, writers have writer's block, 
And Mm -hmm. I think sometimes artists can hit a similar sort of block if they feel the pressure to make the their next painting their magnum opus instead of just oh, like yeah. um, instead of just making work and it will come mm-hmm. like putting the pressure on themselves that n- the next one needs to be my legacy do you do you ever feel that way oh um I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I probably when I was more, when I was younger and I think you have to get to the point where you just don't care anymore. And, <laughs> um, cause, and you, I mean, you do you ha- as an artist, because it's not like a perfect, I mean, there's so many professor, so many of my, well, I, one in particular was like, if there's anything else you could possibly want to do in undergrad, she's like, do that, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's not an easy, um, uh, profession to choose um and you go into it thinking that it it'll be fine you know and and it's it's tough um and um but the joy of painting like for me the joy of painting and um experiencing um the zones that i get into when i'm working um it, it makes it it just it's addictive so i keep going back to it and um uh, john once asked me if there's anything he's like if you've is there anything else that like he's like i'm not really a religious person he's like but if there's anything else that you know god has blessed you with um until that happens stick with me (laughs) 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 and um and so yeah i feel like I mean, he was meaning, you know, a higher power or whatever, because he wasn't really a religious person. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's something I've always done. Um, and now I'm rambling again. But um, I definitely, I think, had to get to that point where I was like, I'm making this work for myself. Um, and if anybody cares, that's great. If anyone doesn't, I'm going to just keep making it. Um, because otherwise you just get too caught up in what the whole big art world. Um, and I think it can influence your work in ways in which, um, you may not want it to unintentionally. Sounds like you've always been an artist. When did you realize that was the case? Um, probably in high school, actually. Uh, I had a great art history. I mean, a great um art class or art drawing and painting teacher um she had us build our own stretchers stretch our own canvases um we could only use primary colors and black and white um and i became more serious about it then um so i knew when i went to college that i wanted to major in art you know you mentioned earlier your gallerist anna i met Anna at uh, the Dallas Art Fair. And there at the Dallas Art Fair, we were talking about your triptych of studies for Mm -hmm. uh, Yayoi. And tell me about that. Is the study, is that something you use in your process all the time? And what information are you learning in your study as part of that process? The way I work now, yes, I do make studies of usually everything um, before I start the final piece. Um, and part of it is just to see if the figures flow together um, and are convincing of being human <laughs> um, <laughs> and reading possibly as one figure. Um, and uh, also, particularly for Yayoi, because there is so much um, going on in that painting. Um, I wanted to figure out a lot of the, I'll sometimes figure out a lot of the colors beforehand. Um, and, uh, like I literally had boxes of, um, paints that were specifically for certain areas of the paintings. It, like, say like for the dots and combinations that I used to make those colors, mm-hmm. um, all that kind of research and trying to figure out color matching and everything is fun for me. Uh, I used to also paint for John Balzari, and so um, we had to, that's probably where I learned the color matching the best, um, and uh, 
it's a challenge <laughs> sometimes. Right. And it's, um, but I didn't, and I didn't start working with oil until college. So, um, and I probably, yeah, it's, um, it, it's fun to research the oil colors and I get kind of nerdy about it. No, no, I, I understand. I feel like color matching is easier with oil because I find that acrylic tends to dry a little bit darker. Oh, yeah. And you think you're matching something just right, and when it's wet, it does, and then when it dries, it, <clears throat> you know. And so you will make multiple studies in the course of doing that? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, with Yayoi, that was the most um, formal one, um, and that was the first time I experimented with doing a, a diptych, triptych, a tick situation mm -hmm. um which i really enjoyed um and want to explore more with um either studies or actual paintings um and um i did sometimes it's just like to experiment to see how the paint is like looks when it's dried so it's nothing that's um then given to anna and michael it's just in my studio it's just for me when, when I look at your work, I see like a delicate balance in the way you render your subjects. You know, I mean, there are places where you give us more detail and places where your brushwork is more loose and maybe even an unpainted surface coming through. I mean, for example, this, uh, this painting, you know, Yayoi that we're talking about, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't look like a Kahinda Wiley. How do you make those choices about, you know, how, because, you know, it is still figurative, you know, how far you want to push realism versus mm. uh, having your painting be more painterly or, you know, showing mm -hmm. more things that are implied. Again, that's a really, another really long question that I, I don't know if, I, I think I'm the one rambling. And so no. th does, th is that a question no, that sort of makes sense? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um it's important to my work actually um it i use I, um i work a la prima so wet on wet um mm -hmm. so uh not letting layers dry um underneath before applying more paint um and i find that that gives off a more immediate um approach uh or feeling about the the work um and lends itself to being more gestural and sometimes more abstract um and lets me tap into my unconscious more um and uh i do the importance for i like to use um areas where it's just the gesso or the original surface um of the painting and um, combine that with the more rendered areas um, and then everything in between um, to emphasize that um, though it is a representational painting of someone and it's a subject, it's also still an object. Um, so I, I like to play with that tension. Um, and uh, so whether it either, um, it sometimes just instinctually comes out when I'm working, something will become more um, rendered than other parts. Um, or I'll have an idea that say, I know I can see in my head how I want to paint this um, and I want it to be more. And I often figure that out in my study in the studies as well too. Yeah, I know I've, I've had some conversations with um, like classically trained portrait artists and they'll they'll talk about a, a notion of um, found and lost lines, which you know is sort of a way of as an artist you're directing the viewer's eye by providing more detail in the places where you want to where you want them to look more closely. It's almost like you're providing more focus for them to guide their eye there. And versus versus other parts of the composition. And I just wonder, you know, I, I feel like for most figurative painters that, that winds up being the eyes, right? Because yeah. we, the gaze winds up being focused. I mean, we're, we're kind of drawn there anyway. And I feel like 
I see that in in your work that regardless of how loose the periphery is, things get a lot tighter the closer we get to the eyes. Am I yeah. is that just my impression <laughs> or I don't intend to do that, but it just happens because eyes are usually like really fun to do. So, right. Um but I hope I hope that um then by having other segments like for, particularly in Yayo, like I, her dress is is just black oil like her black and white dress the main dress in the mm-hmm. front is just black oil paint um and gesso canvas mm-hmm. and so it's really flat and so then i hope that that like comes forward just as much as the eyes do if that makes sense sure um and um but the eyes are the most expressive part and because i'm trying to make a, a figure that has um a new uh subjectivity uh to them i uh i it ends up being usually in the eyes um and it it happens usually unconsciously too the expression and then i know i'm like oh yeah there she is or there there's yayoi (laughs) kind of welcome her (laughs) and and i guess you know a lot of these paintings have have four eyeballs right and Mm so (laughs) there's a lot Lots, lots of opportunity to, you know, to get there. Tell me about the this group show that you're currently in at uh, the Modern in Fort Worth. I recently had Andrea Carnes uh, on the podcast to to talk about it. I, I, what seems really interesting, you know, I put myself in your shoes. I see all of these paintings uh, and who who these paintings that you that you create are named after. You know, some of these same names are in this show that you're in, I right? <laughs> yeah. And so it must, that must really be a, a little surreal. How did Andrea Carnes reach out? Did did she reach out to you and, you know, for a studio visit or a conversation? Or had she known of your work? How, how did you first get contacted? She met uh, Anna and Michael. Uh, they represent the Basquiat Otter estate, um, which uh, Basquiat Otter was uh, involved in a three-person show, I believe, at Fort Worth. Um, so they met her that way. And I think they they just saw each other. And I, I think it was after the show and we're you know, reconnecting and talking about like what they were doing. And she mentioned that she was painting, she was creating or curating the show on, um, excuse me, on women painting women. And um, as good gallery dealers should, <laughs> they <laughs> piped up and said, we represent two women that paint women. And um, which is myself and uh, Alex Hobron, um, who's also in the show. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Andrea, she ended up looking at images of our work. Um, she was actually on on her vacation. She managed to, um, with her uh, two kids, she managed to um, squeeze in a, seeing uh, some of my work in Los Angeles when they were visiting Los right. Angeles. Because um, this is right after like everyone started being kind of able to go um, out after they'd been vaccinated initially or non-vaccinated or whatever you chose, people were leaving their houses um, right. and going on vacation. Um, and she then went up to San Francisco and I was able to meet with her for coffee actually. Um, and I showed her image. So she had seen, she had first thought about putting another uh, painting of mine in the show um, that she saw in Los Angeles. Um, and then uh, she, that was actually named after, uh, Marie Lasnik, who's in the show, um, which would have been kind of funny actually. Right. Um, and, uh, we had coffee and I showed her what I was working on. Um, and immediately she was drawn to, uh, Yayoi, uh, and she had the faith in me to execute it from just seeing the maquette version of it. Um, And uh, I will always um, really, I deeply appreciate 
that about her and be grateful to her for that. Um, and then to find out, it was funny because when Anna initially told me about the show, it wasn't in reference to meeting. She had just heard about it from and I it wasn't in reference to my meeting Andrea. Um, we kind of joked, oh, well, like, wouldn't that be great if, like, I could be in a show with Alice Neal and, and uh, Maria Lasnik, who mm-hmm. I'd name painting right. after, and um, all these people and, and um, all these great women artists. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I was basically over the moon. <laughs> I can I only imagine. Out. That's great. And so you traveled to Fort Worth for the opening, right? I did, um, as did Alex, um, and Natalie Frank came to the opening, and Apolina Sokol came as well, um, and yeah, it was it 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 was really wonderful. Um, I had a great time. It was too short. Right. Um, did you have barbecue? And... No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't told I should. <laughs> did you have Mexican food? Yes, I did. Oh, great. Um, great. But. Uh, yeah, I and I got a lot of good pictures of the show. So and I got to see spend some time there the following day after the opening, um, and just with the paintings. Um, and yeah, the, she, it's a beautiful show. Um, I think she really knocked it out of the ballpark, so to speak. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, just and the way that she organized it. Um, categorically instead of chronologically i think really and the pieces she chose i just were i think so smart to choose um and i just did the it kind of left me with this like feeling of this really good powerful feeling of empowerment it's kind of i describe it as a force sort of and um i am a star wars fan um but uh and it's still resonating with me still um and yeah i hope to go back before it closes so i can yeah study you probably live near skywalker ranch right yeah Uh, i mean that's you know maybe the force is strong where where you live yeah so tell me about the art scene in the bay area because i've always been a little perplexed uh, you know, because I've, I feel like all the ingredients are there for it to be a really uh, artistic hotspot in terms of, you know, people who you think would be inclined to collect and people who mm-hmm. are creative, but mm-hmm. it, to, you know, it seemed, you know, I lived, I lived in, um, outside San Francisco for five years and it just, it just seems like it it wasn't always bubbling up to the surface in terms of what people had on their plate there locally and i mm-hmm. what is it like from from your from your perception of of being an artist there in in the bay area well i think a lot of people remember you know when they think about the bay area they think about the bay area figurative artists one one of which is in the show, Joan Brown, um, who's very important. Um, and, um, that I don't, I mean, it's hard for me as I lived in Los Angeles for 11 years after I graduated. Um, so I am connected to that art world as well. Um, and my gallery is there, uh, right now. Um, and, uh, but all the professors I had at Berkeley were wonderful artists um, and uh, were great professors. I was a uh, Squeak Carmoth, um, who's a pretty big, was a famous Bay Area artist, um, used to teach at Davis as well. Mm-hmm. As well. Um, Catherine Sherwood. Um, and now I think um, I, they, there's a, a lot of new galleries that are opening up that are um, getting a lot of great work, not just from the Bay Area, but from the Bay Area as well. Um, and uh, the De Young also has a new, um, well, she's, not, she's been here for a few years now, uh, Claudia Schmuckley, who's bringing in uh, contemporary work into uh, the De Young and the Legion of Honor mm-hmm. um, and making 
I think there's an effort to um, maybe grow on, hopefully build on, so people don't just think of, oh, it's the Bay Area figurative artist, and then that was it. You know, the, mm -hmm. um, the hard thing is, is that it's so expensive to live here. Um, right. So, um, and, but I mean, Los Angeles is getting that way. It's just as bad now, too. So, right. um, it's, I mean, in New York. So, it's, right. Um, but luckily, um, I think, I know a lot, there's a lot of artists that live out in Sebastopol or like in, up near the wine country when um, they're making it work here. Um, so I think it's an exciting, it's kind of an exciting place to be right now um, because it is growing. Um, and yeah. Sure. Well, let, let me ask, I mean, from, from an artist's perspective, what, what, what is important to you? in terms of where you live, you know, from a marketability standpoint, you probably mm -hmm. want your, your gallerist to be somewhere where they get the most traffic of the right type of collectors. Right. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, in, in the 2020s, can an artist live just about anywhere? You know, I, I think in the old days we would say, well, you really want your artist community is that becoming any more virtual? I mean, do you do you I feel think so? Do you feel like you have an artist community in your area? I mean, or do you feel like you your community is more the folks that you went to UCLA with and they're in Southern California or New York or here or there? And like is our a perception of community broader than, you know, geographically who lives down the street from me? I think it's definitely broader. I, yeah, the whole thing is myth is, and which uh, John did, and other art, you know, the trucking up the blocks in New York City with your work, and and right. um, that's what people did. And um, and now, I mean, I have a community here where my studio is, um, which is in Sausalito, in an old Liberty ship building where they used to build wow. Liberty ships um, during this been renovated into um, a bunch of different studios. It's been there forever. Um, and uh, so I have my community there. Um, and then, and then the friends I still keep in touch with in Los Angeles and then um, just, and then actually a lot of artists that I've met through, uh, online, virtually, Instagram that I keep up with, um, that we have some connections or I met through some uh, common people um, that we've started a dialogue with. So yeah, I think it's really expanding. Um, and that's what's so great about it. Um, I have uh, become friends uh, with artist uh, Richard Wathen, who lives in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, and used to show at the gallery that um, Michael Briggs was the director of in uh, London. Mm -hmm. um, and if I have a painting question for him, I usually will send him a message and, and we'll chat and, or he'll tell me about the work he's been seeing in London. And um, it's great. Actually, I have a friend in New York that I do the same with. I talk to her on the phone all the time and she tells me about the show she's been seeing and vice versa. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I think it's changing. Um, but I also think it's nice to have that, uh, person that can come into your studio that's next door to you. And like, when you're saying, okay, I'm working on this, do you think this would work? Or, Hey, right. I found this great, like oil color, like, have you tried this yet? Or this brush? And, um, so there's, I mean, there's benefits in both. So when you're in grad school, I mean, you, 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 you have endless opportunities to, to get feedback and people's critique. And obviously you have mm -hmm. to learn how to filter out the good information from the bad. Um, <laughs> but it, it sounds like you, you have neighbors in your studio that can, you can bounce things off of. And it's, it's always nice when somebody gives you a tip on uh, on a color or an artist or a brush and, you know, like, oh, hey, I need to try check that out, right? Yeah, the tools, that's important, the tools um, and all the, and I mean, 
getting in uh some people get more into it and i'm one of the ones that gets into what kind of oils i use and um so it's always interesting to find people that like to have that dialogue and then going to the openings here and, sure. and seeing the different shows in san francisco um helps a lot as well because um I'm going to ask this question only because you said you, you uh -huh. nerd out on, on oil paints. So what, what, what do you get excited about? Luckily I paint family. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, well, well, Michael Harding, I mean, you can't really do much better than, I mean, you can, well, I mean, Williamsburg, Mike Harding, Windsor and Newton, um, uh, and, um, there's another with the Amsterdam oh, yeah. one that I'm blanking out on that Elizabeth Payton uses. Yeah. <laughs> she introduced that to me. Neutral tint is the main one I use from them. Um, there's certain colors that I use from different makers. Um, and they're all different, like the cadmium red sure. from, I could go on, on about this, but the cadmium red from Michael Harding is totally different than the cadmium red. Both the cadmium red's lights are completely Absolutely. different shades than uh the Williamsburg one. Um and but Michael Harding, I mean he has paints that he makes a lapis lazuli paint mm -hmm. and an original um Chinese crimson or vermilion paint that's real. Um and he makes a real there's this other color too that's not made anymore that he makes but um so that if you want to invest the money in, you can. Um, uh, and what's funny is that like you can't, I guess in in uh, in Britain, in the United Kingdom, you can't use uh, paints that have lead in them. Um, so he has to make alternatives for because he makes a lead white right. or different lead whites, and um, you can get them here, but you can't get them there, <laughs> even though his paintings, his oil paints are made there. Um, and so that's always a debate that Richard and I have because, um, he, or not a debate, but he, he's upset because he can't use right. their criminals white. And so, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that there's my nerdy, um, yeah. yeah. My my nerdy, I could go on. Well, I mean, like you know, I'll use Windsor Newtons, and I'll like often choose the hue because the hue is they're they're trying mm -hmm. to match the color without the the carcinogenic heavy metals, you know, or right, right. Because I yeah, I can't trust myself that I'm not going to you know accidentally stick the end of my brush in my mouth at some point along the way. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you do. You do run into yeah. that. Ha yeah, that hazard. Right. Yeah, but um, you have to be careful. I think people are a lot more careful than they used to be with those kinds of things. So. What's on the horizon? You know, do you feel like some women? Do you feel like there is um, enough variety in in that mix that y you have years of, of of work ahead of you, or in, do you already for, do you already mm -hmm. do you already foresee you know divergent paths? You know, because some artists wind up having multiple bodies of work that they can kind of sure. rotate through. What, how do you feel about where you are? I feel really excited. Um, I this so far um i don't see the end of the paintings that i'm gonna make with uh these that where these animals are combined with the women um and then after that i've already have an idea uh for a show as well or for a series um that continues with this um uh that addresses um actually that addresses mental illness and um, how women have been perceived um, in art history, like uh, Medusa and Ophelia and uh, paintings like that, which will be fun to dive into when it gets to that yeah. point. Great. So, Christiane, if, if folks wanted to keep track of you and your, uh, your work and how things are progressing, Where's the best place for someone to stay up on your uh, your comings and goings? Um, probably, well, uh, my website, which is my name, uh, .com, and then my gallery, Alex Eddie and Briggs, um, and then Instagram. Um, for 
things that are happening in my studio um, that are going on now. I, I usually post. I try. I, I try to keep up to date with Instagram. I'm getting better at it. Right. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, that that's that's where I post a lot of my studies too. Um, and like I said, that's where I've met uh, conveniently and. Um, for all that there are some bad things about Instagram, but there are some good things about it because I've met a lot of nice artists through it um, and uh, have started a lot of great dialogues that way too. So awesome. Um, yeah. And I always answer people back. Great. You haven't. That's, that's <laughs> so, very courteous. Uh, well, it's a way to meet new people. Yeah. Too, so, and so um, you know, I don't know if everyone's willing to meet new people. And so, you know, Oh. Thank you for being willing. Thank you for being willing to talk to me oh, today. That's too bad. Yeah, you always have to have curiosity about everything. Yeah. Keep makes life interesting. Uh, I'm very curious. And so, Christian, I, I really appreciate your time today. And thank you for answering my, uh, my long-winded, prying questions. And, um, you know, I, I wish you all the best. Oh, thank you. And um, thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. And um, I... It's always nice to have those questions to answer because um, I love talking about my work and, and particularly getting nerdy about oils and all that. And so it, it's, a, it's a nice opportunity to be able to talk about it. So I appreciate you giving that. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at Thanks for listening.